Man, what a trailer. <laughs> That's awesome. Woo. Um, hey, welcome, all of you online, all of our campuses, all of us here today. Now, I'm guessing that today, 1115 service are, are people that moved here from other places um, because the Cowboy Games at 12 and you still love Jesus and you're here. Um, yeah, and, and so if the rapture takes place, you guys will be first. Okay, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, hey, glad you're here today. Two things, worship night is tonight. So if you, you can make it five o'clock right here at these campus, all of our campuses coming together and we're gonna worship the Lord together. If you could help us uh, by um, uh, uh, responding and letting us know you're here, parking and childcare, that would help us greatly. So there's the QR code, just while I'm talking. You can uh, sign up, RSVP, we'd love to have you. It's just a great time of worship and prayer. Um, the second thing is, I don't know if you knew this, September 15th to October 15th is Hispanic Heritage Month here in the U.S. So if you come from uh, Spain, if you come from Latin America, South America, Central America, Mexico, uh, we celebrate your culture, we celebrate the, your, your value to our country, and so if you come from that heritage, we love you. Can we give them a hand? Love you. Que paso, amigo? Love it. Um, and, and for those of you from Brazil, I know that you don't speak Spanish, I know you speak Portuguese, and so I said, que paso. I don't even know if that makes sense to you, but hey, glad you're here anyway. All one family. Uh, today, starting a brand new series, The End Times. I'm excited about this today. Um, man, it's gonna be fun. Um, a lot of times when we talk about end times, some words come to your mind, right? Uh, maybe it's uh, fascinating, and some of us are fascinated with the study of end times, and and we love it, and, and we, uh, we, we love to hear about it, we love to read about it, and so forth. Some of us, uh, man, it's scary. Uh, when I was growing up, the end times, and our church talked about it a lot, it was always scary. Man, I was like, ooh, I don't wanna do anything wrong and miss, okay, so I'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, some of it's confusing. Some of us would say, no, you know, I've read Revelation, and, and, I, and I just don't get it. And I understand, you just look at Revelation without any help, without any context. Uh, it's a difficult book to, to read and to, you know, to just put into to, uh, outline or, or understanding of the end times. So it may be confusing, maybe uh, controversial. Maybe uh, there's some things about the end times that are very controversial and um, you know, dates and current events and characters and so forth and, and it can get controversial. Maybe some of us are dogmatic about our view, and this is the only view, and this is the right way, and, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then some of us may, it's just fantasy. That whole thing is just not real. It's a whole made-up story, and, and um, I don't really think it has much merit. Wherever you are or wherever you land on end-time things, the, the Bible is clear about a picture of the world um, in the end. <clears throat> Whatever your eschatological view, and I'll talk about that in a minute, is there is a picture in the Word of God about how the world comes into God's plan. And whether you were taught uh, in your growing up years, maybe you have a, a theological teaching framework of, of the end times, you have a perspective. Um, maybe you don't. Maybe your church never really talked about it. Uh, maybe you never really studied it, and this is all going to be new. I I'll tell you this that this message, this beginning, is real technical. I'm gonna give you a lot of terms and I'll try to define those terms as I say them. And if this is all new to you, just stay with us. This series is gonna be a fun series. Um, but there's also some, today is a real technical service, just kind of information. Um, last week, Rod, my good buddy Rod spoke and talked about Project Rescue, and by the way, I think by the end of the day, we're gonna be at $350,000 that we have brought in for Project Rescue. Isn't that awesome? So, um, so as we, now the, the, last week was very emotional and it was very moving, compassion. This week, not so much. Um, but I hope at the end, I'm gonna bring it all to an end and I hope that it will help you. And uh, like, here's what, where I'd like to start. I'd like to give us some suggestions as we approach end times. After that, I'm gonna give you a definition of eschatology, and then we're gonna look at the four main th 
theological perspectives of end times. The suggestions first. Number one, don't be afraid of studying end times. Many of us, because we've heard it, read it, watched it, and it's scary or it's confusing or it's like, really? We just kind of stay away from it. And many of us have the view, which I understand this view, is, hey, it's all going to pan out in the end, so I don't really care. It is good to study. Revelation chapter 1, as John starts this letter of the book of Revelation, he says, this is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the, the events that must soon take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant John, who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. God, listen, God blesses those who reads the words of this prophecy to the church. And he blesses all those who listen to its message and obey what it says for the time is near. Chapters two and three, right after this, this is chapter one. Chapters two and three, he has a, a kind of a, a, a teaching to the churches that he's writing this to. John, the disciple, is also the guy who wrote this book. He wrote the Gospel of John, wrote first, second, and third John, and then he wrote Revelation. He gives to these seven churches in modern-day Turkey, um, most of them a warning. They were complacent. They were lukewarm. They were tolerating different things in their own lives, not talking about the world, talking about the church. And so when it says message and obey, it's, it's for us to listen to. So it is good for us to read. It is good for us to study in times. The second suggestion, I believe, is hold your end-time perspectives loosely. I used to not do this. I used to have a very rigid, like, this is the way it is. And I've, of, of, uh, of all the, the theological things to study, I probably have studied this the most, the book of Revelation, at least the way I was taught and the way that I have described it for many years. I can go backwards and forwards in the book of Revelation, give you an outline. I can talk about it, blah, blah, whatever, whatever. The older I get, and I don't know if you are like me, but the older I get, the less I know. So I, I, I just say that I think it's a better idea to not, not have a perspective. I'm not saying don't have a perspective and not have a, a, a way in which you believe things will happen. I think that's totally fine. Holding them loosely, I think, is necessary. Anybody who tells you, and I really mean this, and you can be mad at me if you want to. I'll still love you. Hopefully you'll love me. I, I think anybody who tells you that they know exactly how it should do, how it, it goes, I think... Uh, they have deceived themselves. I think there are many ways to look at this, and I'll ta I'll, we'll talk about those. I don't know that there is a dogmatic one way. I, I don't believe there is. So hold them loosely. In other words, don't be a dogmatic. And if you're looking for a dogmatic series, you're going to be disappointed. This is not a dogmatic series. This is, I'm going to give you some things that I think are going to be helpful and useful for you as you look at the end times. Hold your perspectives loosely. The third, and I believe this is really important, be cautious with modern prophetic predictions. Um, I, was, uh, I was starting in ministry in 1987. That was my first year. And uh, a guy wrote a book, 19, uh, or 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 1988. How many remember that book? No, you don't remember that. Okay, good. Um, he was wrong. So the end of that year, he wrote another book, Why He's Coming Back in 1989, Why I Missed It. And I am making fun of him. I love him. I don't know who he is, but uh, I think anybody who inserts current events, now I know, I know some of you are going to be like, John, I don't believe that, inserts current events to prophecy is in danger. I was, I'm 56 years old. I've been raised in the church, and our church that I was raised in talked about prophecy and talked about revelation, talked about the rapture, and talked about all, I mean, a lot. And I remember characters being inserted, current events being inserted in end times, and every single one of them was wrong. If you look back through 2,000 years of history, and you look at the events of those years of, the, at least the history of Christianity and the world in the last 2,000 years, there are so many events that we could insert into prophecy and it would make sense at the time, and then we'd come to realize, oh, that wasn't real. I remember one of them, Henry Kissinger being the Antichrist. 
That was in the 70s, and, and, and he was, that was totally wrong. So I say, be cautious with modern prophetic predictions about characters, current events, and dates. Here's why. Matthew 24, 36. However, no one knows the day or the hour. Can you say no one with me? No one. That means you. That means any prophetic guy, apostle, bishop on YouTube. No one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the son himself. Only the father knows. Acts chapter one, verse six. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore your kingdom? Is this the time? We, were, we, we, are, incess- we are fascinated, fixed on dates. And he replied, the father alone is the authority to set those dates and times and it is none of your business. That's the way I translate the Greek, okay? So be cautious about the prophetic. Now, let me, uh, let me give a disclaimer. I believe in all the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I believe in all of them. I believe that there are prophetic words. I don't know that I agree with what modern day charismatic Pentecostals view as prophetic words, as always prophetic words. I think they are guesses. For instance, I got many, many emails during the election before uh, President Biden got elected, many emails stating prophecies. I watched some of them on YouTube that were forwarded to me that Trump was going to be president and he was going to be inaugurated. John, don't say anything stupid because it is going to happen. Guess what? They were wrong. And if you, if you care to prophesy about the prediction of an election, can I just tell you that even if God's not in it, you have a 50% chance of being right. So just because you were right doesn't mean you know and God told you. So I say this with caution because I believe in, in that God can speak in this day. I do believe that. However, I think we got to be really careful. And there's some people out there that, that, that fixate on things that they can gain resources from, in other words, money. And I'm just telling you as a, as a pastor who loves you, and you can disagree with me, that's fine. You can watch all you want to. Be careful. Okay, that's enough of that. Let me give you the definition of eschatology. You know, let me tell you where we're going, actually. Where we're going in, in uh, uh, this series. Week one, I'm going to talk about eschatology 101. I'll give you the definition in a minute. Weeks two and three, I'm going to give you some events that I believe are important for us as believers to know. I think you need to have a working knowledge of these events over the next two weeks. We're gonna talk about those. Week four, we're gonna talk about, uh, I'm gonna do Q&A. We're gonna have, uh, there's hundreds, hundreds, I think seven or 800 now that have come in questions. I'm not, I, can't, I can't answer all of them. And a lot of them were the same. One of them was, uh, hey, if the Dallas Cowboys win the Super Bowl, does that mean Jesus is coming back? You know, I don't know, but we'll see. So um, eschatology 101 today, and let me give you a working definition. This comes from eschatology, the, the word comes from the Greek word eschatos, which simply means last. That's why it's called eschatology. That just last study, last things. The Webster's D- Dictionary of, of eschatology is a branch of theology concerned with the final events in the history of the world or of humankind. So when you hear me say eschatology or eschatological or something like that, that is, all that means is a theological word that, that it defines the end times. Okay, that's, that's all it is. Now, for us to have a good working knowledge, I could tell you only one way or one perspective. What I'm going to try to do in, a, in the next couple of minutes is give you the four main theological perspectives of the end times for the most part in Christianity for the last 2,000 years. There are some things that I like about all of them. There are some things that I disagree with some in some of them, but I think it would be important to lay the groundwork for us to have a working knowledge of the dominant thoughts or perspectives that scholars have had over the last 2,000 years, starting with the early church all the way to today, of the end times. The first one, I'll give you a list of all of them, historic premillennialism. That is 
the first one, and that's the oldest one. The second is dispensational premillennialism and premillennialism, and they are literal twins. In other words, they both have a perspective that prophetic utterings in, in Daniel, in Matthew, in Revelation are, for the most part, literal. Okay, so both of these have a more literal tone to them when you read Revelation, and there's some, a lot of symbols, you know, four-eyed creatures or, you know, whatever, and you're like, what? They have a literal meaning to them, and, and for the most part. Now, the last two are more symbolic. Amillennialism and then postmillennialism, and these are symbolic twins. Most of these have a more... Uh, symbolic way of understanding revelation or end times. But for the most part, these, and I understand, and I'm not going to give you all the details of every one of these, but we're going to go through each one of these, give you the earmarks and, and, and main things about each one of them. And, and I understand that there may be other thoughts that are not included in these. I totally understand that. But for the most part in Christianity, scholars view the four main views of eschatology in, in these parameters. Let's start with the first one, historic premillennialism, and that is the oldest held view. From the second, third, fourth centuries as Constantine, uh, the emperor of Rome in the 300s AD, converted to Christianity as the, the leaders of the Christian church gained influence politically, and that wasn't always a bad thing, there became this um, um, uh, real rush uh, to put the canon together, the, the New Testament books of the Bible, the Matthew through Revelation. And as they did, there were some views that came into debate. Uh, the Trinity was one of the d big debates of the day. The canon of the New Testament, in other words, the books of the Bible that would be uh, 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 accepted. And eschatology. This would be the oldest held view, again, more of a literal uh, understanding. Here are the earmarks. Time of tribulation, there will be a time, not necessarily seven years, as, as Revelation or Daniel's 70 weeks talks about. It's a time of tribulation that, that is at the end of, of the world, and the church will overcome that time. In other words, not going to be taken out of that time. The church will have the strength the grace to overcome during that time. After that time of tribulation, there's going to be a resurrection and transformation, a resurrection of those who, are, who have died and will come to life, believers who have died, and transformation of those of us who are alive and remain when Jesus comes back. A lot of us are familiar with the term rapture. How many are familiar with the term rapture? Okay, so when I, I'll use that term, but it's not a biblical term, so I prefer to use resurrection and transformation as a more literal understanding of what's going to happen. The dead in Christ will rise first, and then we which are alive and remain will be transformed into bodies that will never die like Jesus had. So right now when a believer passes away, their spirit goes to heaven, their body obviously stays on earth. There's going to be a resurrection, like Jesus had a resurrection. It, the spirit and the body will come together. They'll have new bodies that will never die. We who, if he comes back when we're alive, we'll be transformed. So again, I know some of these things are new to some of you. Some of you is like, oh yeah, I knew that. Just so we, we're clear on that. So first thing that's going to happen, there's going to be a time of tribulation, and then there's going to be the resurrection and transformation, and then there's going to be the return of Christ. These are almost simultaneous return of Christ, which is called the second coming, and then there's going to be a thousand-year physical reign um, of Jesus on the earth, peace and prosperity, and then there's going to be the final battle, Gog and Magog. During this thousand-year reign, the enemy, the devil, is put into a, a prison, so to speak, and then after that thousand years, he'll be loosed, and he'll deceive some of the nations, and there'll be a final battle, and then there's the final judgment, and then there's the restoration of all things. Okay, so this is of uh, the historic premillennialism, a few other things to, to note about this. Some symbolic interpretations, but most of it is literal. The second is interesting that Israel or Jews 
does, do not have or does not have a distinct redemptive plan in the end times. So in other words, the prophecies and promises in the Old Testament will be fulfilled through the church, not Israel, in the end times. So they don't have any you know, redemptive plan or there's not a plan for them except they grafted into the church. As we have been grafted into God's family as Gentiles, the, the Jews or the Israel will be grafted into the church. Okay, so that's a, that's a big difference between historic and, and dispensational. So those are the two big, so let me go to number two, which is dispensational premillennialism, which is the newest held view. 1800s, um, and really the end of the 1800s, into the 1900s, this is when this view became very, very popular. And most of us who were raised in evangelical America in the last 150 years have been taught this view. Uh, Tim LaHaye, uh, Left Behind, Hal Lindsey, the late great planet Earth in the 70s, Schofield in the early 1900s, and he wrote the Schofield Bible that has this dispensational view of premillennialism. Um, it's the newest held view. Very much like historic with a few differences. Here's the uh, earmarks of dispensational. There's gonna be a resurrection and transformation or a rapture that happens first at the end of time. There's gonna be a, a, a rapture or a resurrection and transformation. Right after that, there's seven year tribu literal seven year tribulation and the church will miss that tribulation. As opposed to historic, the church will overcome. This one, the church will miss it. There's gonna be a time of tribulation, and then there's the return of Christ, the battle of Armageddon. Then there is the thousand-year reign, literal reign in Jerusalem, reigning peace and, and, and prosperity for the world. And then there's gonna be the final battle, Gog and Magog. And then there's gonna be the final judgment, and then there's gonna be the restoration of all things. Now, a few differences, and, and, and further in, in understanding this particular view, the second group is this, strictly literal interpretation of, of revelation, very literal, not a lot of symbolism, we're going to take it literal. The second thing, which is a big difference between uh, dispensational and historic, is that Israel and the church are separate entities, and Israel has a distinct redemptive plan. So the promises in, in the Old Testament um, will be fulfilled in Israel. And, and it's not that we're like two separate families of God. We're one family of God. But Israel is distinct, and it does have a role in, in the uh, redemptive plan of God and the end of the world. All right? So that's, that's dispensational. And, and by the way, dispensational really means season of time. Okay? It just means, so, so in other words, let me give you a few examples. Right now, when Jesus, uh, the, uh, well, let's say the, the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2. Holy Spirit came down, filled the disciples and, and those who were gathered there. The early church started from that moment until the rapture or the resurrection and transformation. That is a dispensation of the church or the dispensation of grace. Time period of the church, time period of grace. Then there's the dispensation of the tribulation, seven years. Then there's the dispensation of the millennial reign, thousand years, and then the final judgment and restoration of all things. They're more segmented and seg, uh, seg, uh, segregated and, and literal times rather than figurative times. Okay, so that's dis dispensational, just so you're aware. Okay, number three, how many still with me? How many still with me? Like, okay, keep going. All right, here we go. Amillennialism. Now, this became popular with St. Augustine, and many of us have, have read some of his work and his prayers. Uh, he did not come up with this, but he made it popular. Amillennialism. Let's, let's look at some of the earmarks of this. This is an interesting one. The kingdom of God was inaugurated at the resurrection of Christ. So, in other words, the millennial reign, like, like dispensationals say that's a thousand-year reign, a reign of Jesus Christ. The amillennialists believe that the kingdom, the reign of Christ was inaugurated when Jesus rose from the dead. So we are living in the millennial right now, very different from the other two. Um, uh, Christ is now reigning over the church. So, uh, that, that, so right now we're in this, this millennial reign. He's reigning over the church, and he's the, oh, of course he is, the head of the church, but they believe that that is the millennial. 
It's not a separate event that's going to happen later. It, we are in the millennial, the reign of Christ. And then there's going to be, at some part in this reign, there's going to be the return, physical return of Christ. And then there's going to be a resurrection and transformation of those who are dead in Christ and those who are alive when he comes back. Just all of the, the views have this. And we'll talk more about this in the next couple, uh, coming weeks. And then there's going to be the final judgment. And then the church in its eternal state is established. Okay, so this, there, there's a couple more things about this view that are, that are interesting. The first is that it relies heavily on a two-age theology, which is already not yet. So what they believe, and I'm giving generalities here, is that prophecies of Daniel or of Matthew or of Revelation or First Thessalonians, uh, or some, when there's talk of end times, those things have already been fulfilled in the first century, but yet there's going to be another age in which they will be fulfilled again. In other words, we call it dual prophecy kind of uh, uh, perspective of eschatology. It happened, but it's going to happen again, or it's already, not yet kind of theology. Another thing about amillennialist is the church is the eschatological fulfillment of Israel. So, Israel and the church become one. There is no, in other words, the church is going to really becomes Israel or Israel becomes the church and all the promises in the Old Testament are fulfilled in the church and Israel who have come to Christ, that's one. Okay, so there, there, there is no eschatological redemptive plan of Israel in the amillennialist. Okay, so that's a big difference too from um, dispensational view. All right, now, Four, let's go to number four, post-millennialism. This is the most interesting to me. This, is, this has some uh, different thoughts. Um, the first one is that the church or the gospel eventually grows to influence slash impact for the whole world, in the whole world, and then it's literally a Christianization of the world. So in other words, the gospel from the early church to now will continue to grow, continue to grow, and it's going to infiltrate the world as we know it, and the world would become mostly, not everyone, but mostly Christian. So in other words, things for the church get more powerful and get more influential, and, and I'm not talking about politically necessarily, but I'm talking about uh, kingdom of God grows until such a time then when Christ will return or this period of time is a, oh, so, so uh, let me, let me I, I, I skipped ahead, but the church age is right now. The figurative millennial reign is what we're living in right now. And then after that, the return of Christ is second coming. And then there's going to be a resurrection and transformation uh, of those who are dead in Christ and those who are alive, just like I've talked about. And then there's the final judgment. And then there's the fullness of heaven. So in other words, the big difference here is there, there is no uh, tribulation period. Uh, that's already happened. Um, this is a things get better and bigger and more influential until Jesus comes. And then the rest of it's pretty, you know, the same as, as the other ones, maybe with a few exceptions of when it happens sequen sequentially. Now, a couple more things about post-millennialism is most prophecies have been fulfilled in the first century. There's not a two and, or already, not yet. Most of them have already been fulfilled, and we're just looking at a few things that were written that will come to pass. The second is the church is the eschatological fulfillment of Israel, just like uh, the first, I mean, just like uh, all millennialists. So the church is the eschatological fulfillment. We become one, and we fulfill all the prophecies and promises in the Old Testament. Okay, so whew, that was pretty good. Got all that done in, in just a few minutes. How many are thoroughly confused? All right. Now, the big question, I think there are two, but the big question is this. Which one is right? How many would, no, I'm kidding. I'm not going to ask you. Which one is right? And this is where I know that I drive people crazy. Um, there are a few things that I am die on the hill on. There are, uh, uh, there, uh, one of them being, that Jesus and his atoning work on the cross is the only way in which we are reconciled to the Father. I will die on the hill for that. That's a non-negotiable for me. 
that Jesus is coming back, his second coming, is a non-negotiable for me. And I'll talk more about the, that, that, the, the kind of non-negotiables for me as it relates to eschatology in the next few weeks. But there are most things about eschatology that I hold very loosely. I used to not. I'm not so dogmatic anymore as it relates to which one is right. And I know that drives some people crazy. I can almost hear it in the email right now. John, take a stand, for goodness sakes. I, I know, I totally get it. But I, I just think, and I really do believe this, you can make all the theological, doctrinal statements you want. Nobody really knows exactly how this all you just can't, you cannot convince me that you know it all. So the, the, the answer to this is, I think, or the question, which one is right, is, is the wrong question. It's not a bad question. It's not that we can't answer it or at least attempt to answer it. But I think there's a better question. That is, why does this matter? That's a better question. Why does the study of end times or a knowledge of the end times, why does that matter that we would have knowledge? Many of us want to stay away from it. Many of us want to just stick our head in the sand and say, hey, it's all going to pan out in the end. Who cares? We win. I understand that. But here's why. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. The spirit and the bride say, come, come. Let anyone who hears this say, come. In other words, come, Lord Jesus. Or come to Jesus. Let anyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who desires drink freely from the water of life. The reason I think it's important, one of them, is because there are people in our lives that are thirsty and they don't even know it. They're thirsty for the things of God they're thirsty for something more in their lives besides buying more stuff, accumulating more things, even winning a political battle. When it, when, at the end of the day, when they put their head on the pillow at night, there's something missing. And you and I as believers know what that is because God has created us in his image. And he's created us with the, the plan that we would be his family. And when that is not lining up, there's something that's missing from our lives. So there are many who we work with and many who we're neighbors with that are thirsty and let anyone who desires, come, come. So us having an understanding that this does matter, that this life is not all there is, that when Jesus says in John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe would not perish, but have what? That matters. Everlasting life, the hope that this life is not all there is, matters. And so that we would have an answer, as Peter in his epistle says, hey, when somebody has questions about your faith, give an answer. So that when we, talking at lunch, having discussions with our neighbor and things come up, those things often do, not that we're dogmatic in my opinion, but that we have an answer. We have a perspective. We have the hope of something better than what this world is offering. So I think it's important that, that the end times and, and having knowledge of this matters. Acts chapter one, we read this a minute ago, but I'm gonna read even further. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, is the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? Let me stop there again. Many of us become distracted with dates, characters, and current events. Just like the disciples. Hey, 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 you, go, you, you coming? You gonna, you gonna restore the kingdom right now? And Jesus says, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times. They're not for you to know. But listen to this. This is where we get the promise of power and the promise of the Holy Spirit to work in and through our lives. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And listen to this. In context 
of the question in the context of, hey, are you coming? When are you coming? Are you going to establish your kingdom now? Are you going to restore the, the kingdom of Israel? In the context of that question, he says, hey, don't worry about the times. You be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, starting in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's why this matters. That, that we would not get distracted with so much so. And again, it's not wrong to study this. I want you to study this. I want you to have a good working, even if it disagrees with mine. I don't, that's fine. But at the end of the day, you have a working knowledge of why eschatology or why the, the picture that God has given us in the book of Revelation and other places about end times, why it matters. Because we have an understanding, a working knowledge, and our job is not to insert dates and characters and events. Our job is to be a witness. All the while knowing that we have the hope of something better, the hope of eternal life. That this world, as, as sin-ridden, cancer, disease, war, famine, tears, sorrow, pain, what we talked about last week when Rod was here, all of those things go away. And he restores all things to the way in which God designed in the first place. And there will be no more crying, no more sadness, no more tears. Guys, look at me. This matters that we have that hope that there is something that's better coming and he's promised us this. And if your life is good right now, you can't even imagine. We can't even understand what he has planned. That's what Paul says. We can't, even, we can't even put into words what he has. So if you think your life is awesome right now, you're a loser. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying individually you're a loser. We have no idea. We have no idea what he has planned. So as believers, that's why this stuff matters. That's why this matters. Because there's something that we have to do. And that is be a witness. Not worry about dates and times. Let's live our lives and be the light of this world. And I've said this during COVID, the political, racial, um, medical upheaval of our world in the last three years. Of all the people on the planet, I want you to look at me. Of all the people on the planet who should be at peace. Of all the people on the planet who should be in unity with, with whatever race you come from. Can I just tell you, that makes no difference what color you are, what culture you are. In the body of Christ, we are one. And of all the people on the planet, I don't get how you don't get that. That of all the people on the planet who should be walking in joy and walking in peace and walking in this encouragement that Paul talks about, when he talks about the, the rapture, the, the transformation and, and resurrection, he says, encourage one another with these words. We should be the most encouraging people on the planet. The most peace-filled people on the planet. The most unified, the most loving people on the planet. Why? Because what comes matters. And we want to take as many people as we can to connect them to the grace and the love and the power of God so that their lives are abundant here and eternal there. So if you're here today, listen, and you're a believer and you have become distracted with the things of this world. And it's easy to do. I become distracted just like you. We get distracted with political things. We get distracted with material things. We get distracted with relational things. We get distracted. And if you're a believer here, and you have, you have allowed the things of this world to rob you of the real purpose and maybe it's even eschatological distractions. Maybe you're the one who's been sending me videos. Listen, don't get distracted with all those things. Do we long for his return? Do we look for his return? Yes and amen. 
Are we consumed with all the details of dates and characters? Absolutely not. We have a mission, let's not get distracted. So if you're a believer and you've grown complacent or comfortable, Revelation chapter two and three talks about us who have become comfortable, complacent, lukewarm. Get right with God. Don't let this world suck you in. And if you're here and you've never accepted what Jesus has done for you on the cross and the only way in which we are reconciled to him, John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And if you're here today and you've never accepted what Jesus has done for you, in other words, he paid for our sin so that once and for all, our sins would be forgiven, past, present, and future, so that we have a hope of eternal life, everlasting life this life is not all there is. I hope that today, whoever you are, complacent, comfortable Christian, or somebody who's never really accepted what Jesus has done, and you're sitting here today and you're thinking, man, this kind of makes sense. Yes, it does. It makes all the sense in the world. So would you bow your heads? Lord, for, for all of my friends here who may be comfortable, complacent, lukewarm, distracted, bought into this world and all the systems thereof, we repent of our sin, we repent of our distractions, we repent of our selfishness. And we come back to our first love. For those of us who have never accepted what you've done, Jesus, and and we've heard it maybe before, we've, 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 we've talked about it, we've kind of doubted and gone back and forth and and maybe today we're not here by accident whatever campus we're sitting at wherever we're at online we're here for a reason and you, you wanted to get our attention today to say that you do have a plan for us here and you do have a plan for later and I pray that they would accept that plan right now and and repent of our sin bow our knee confess your name and be saved. Lord, I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.